And Heidi, as soon as you are ready, I will let the folks in. Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you all so much for coming to the final installment of Plug and Play Music Day, CMC's Virtual Open House Part 2. Um, for those of you who have not met me yet, my name is Julie Steinberg. I'm the Executive Director, and I'm so happy to be joined today by one of our fabulous strings faculty, violin and viola, Ms. Heidi Kim. Uh, Heidi is just one of the most dedicated, creative, amazing teachers that we have, whether you find her uh, leading a spooky recital in our concert hall, uh, creating really beautiful videos as part of our field day extravaganza, um, Heidi really is such a great teacher. So thank you, Heidi, so much for being here. And to all of you who are joining us today, jump in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Tell us what inspired you to be a part of our Plug and Play Music Day. We would love, love to know. Uh, one quick note, we are recording this session. Um, so we do that because we want to keep documentation of all the great work of our faculty and students. But if you wouldn't like to be recorded, you can simply just turn off your video. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure we all do is put ourselves on mute. I'm sure that many of you have experienced the um, sound glitches that can happen on Zoom, so we'd like to eliminate that if possible. So go ahead and put yourself on mute, but please jump in the chat throughout this lesson if you have questions or thoughts, um, you want to know how to access something at CMC, you want to know more about Heidi, just jump in the chat um, and we will do our best to answer your questions and make sure that you Excuse are Excuse me. Yes. Um, I'm Linda Greenberg and I'm blind. I can't use the chat. So if people would talk, I mean, describe things as much as they can, it would be good. Absolutely. But I'll just try to be quiet and not bother you. No, no problem, Linda. That's just fine. Thank you for letting me know. We'll definitely pay special attention. Um, great. So uh, one thing I want to make sure everybody knows that we have happening today uh, is a really special offer for new students who are coming to us here in the middle of our fall quarter or for students who are coming back perhaps after an absence we have a special you can get six lessons for the price of five plus a 35 percent off discount um, we really want to welcome as many people as we can to our community right now to have them experience the joy of making and playing music together um, so if you are interested in that uh, you can visit us at our website, sfcmc.org slash lesson package to learn more. You'll find that in our chat as well. Um, you can also give CMC a call and talk to one of our wonderful registrars. So with that, I want to turn it over to Heidi. Heidi has been on our faculty at CMC since 2018, but she has also played all over the country. Uh, she's performed solo at Carnegie Hall, uh, at the Chautauqua Institution, uh, Interlochen. Um, she's played all around the Bay Area. She's also a wonderful dancer, which is something she uh, may, you may not know about her. So Heidi, I would love to turn it over to you to introduce us to the violin today. All right. Thank you so much, Julie, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming out on this really hot afternoon to attend this class. I'm super excited to share uh, information about the violin, which hopefully you might be interested in taking after this class. So the first thing we're going to do, um, oh, and by the way, as the event description said, you don't have to necessarily have a violin in order to get something out of this class. If you have a violin, great, but if you don't, if you have maybe a stuffed animal or maybe something rectangular, anything that you can prop up on your shoulder and hold down with your chin will work just fine. Maybe like a narrow tissue box, just anything. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is first get to know the instrument that we are gonna be learning about today. So the, the violin, like human beings and animals have many parts to it. But for the sake of today, I'm just gonna focus on a few. So obviously we have the violin here. It's made of wood. 
The shiny things here are what we call strings, which are usually made of some kind of metal. Underneath the strings, you'll notice there's a black plank underneath. So that's what we call the fingerboard because it's a board that we put our fingers on. Okay, and the last body part I'm going to introduce is the bridge, which is just this little piece of wood, but it's really important to have because it holds up our strings. If the bridge was not there, the strings would fall limp and you wouldn't be able to make a productive sound on your violin. Okay, um, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about how we're going to get it up here on our shoulder in the first place. So it's a three-step process. The first step is stop. Second step is flip. And the third step is tuck. So stop, flip, tuck. Okay, and I'll just show you really quick what that looks like. So here's our stop, flip, and tuck. And you should be able to ideally hold the violin without the use of your hands. But if you can't do it right away, that's okay. It just means that your neck muscles just don't um, have the strength yet, but they will over time if you keep at it. Okay, so for the stop, um, for placement, we want it off at a diagonal, so about a 45. So to find that, let's compare it with the violin being directly in front of us. And now we're gonna open our left arm to uh, the left, and we don't want that either. So we want it in the middle between those two points. So that's our stop. You're gonna freeze. You're not gonna be swinging your violin around. You're gonna stop, like a stop sign, and then flip. So this is really important for the flip. So you'll notice that the inside of my arm, it's gonna point up to the ceiling when I do the second step. And then the third step is tuck. So you just bring it in on that diagonal line that you found in the first step. And then you hold for as long as you can. You can do this with your arms. You can go around in a circle, still doing this with your arms. And that is how you get your violin up on your shoulder. Okay, any questions so far? No, okay, great. Um, so the next thing is our left hand. So this is what our left hand is supposed to look like when we're playing. Um, this is a really common um, thing that I see in my students is their hand going like this into what I call pancake mode or the wrist maybe jutting out a little bit too far out. Neither of these we want to have. This is not, you know, terribly painful to play in, but this definitely is over time and we don't want to be playing in pain ever. So again, we want to find that middle point where our wrist is neutral and it's this one beautiful unbroken line while we're playing. And for our fingers, you're going to just have them hovering gently over the fingerboard. Remember the fingerboard is the black plank that's underneath the strings. You want to have your fingers just hovering gently like helicopters ready to land whenever you want them to over the fingerboard. And your thumb is just, just uh, gently resting on the side of the other side of the neck. Okay, so that's what that looks like. All right, does anybody want to maybe take a stab at demonstrating the stop, flip, tuck? If you do want to volunteer, you can wave your hands with the emoji or maybe type in the chat really quick. Saw a couple, oh, okay, Theo wants to. Okay, could we spotlight Theo really quick? You take your instrument, you're gonna do this. You're gonna do this, stop. So let's take your violin off your shoulder. Yeah, stop, hold it down and then flip it up. Flip it up this way, flip the other way, flip the other way, flip the other way. There you go, and then tuck, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Yes, good job not hitting your violin in your face. That's really good, <laughs> okay. And then can you hold it without 
using your hands. Can you hold it with your, <gasps> good job, yay. Nice work, okay. And can I see your hand? Can you uh, just try putting your left hand up and show me that beautiful unbroken line? So maybe let's have you pivot slightly to the side so that I can see. Yes, good. And then can you have your fingers hovering over the fingerboard like they're helicopters waiting to land, but still keeping that nice unbroken line? And then turn them to the... Yes, that's the idea. And then just try plopping down a finger or two on your fingerboard like this. So when you plop them down, they kind of are making like a round tunnel-ish shape. You don't want them like this. You just want them rounded. Yeah. That's good. That's a great, that's a really great start. Nice job. Let's give a hand for Theo. Yay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on now to the right hand, to the right hand, because we are going to utilize something called the bow. So it's this uh, other piece of wood that we use. And I'm just going to tighten it. So attached to this piece of wood here, which you call the stick, we have this white thing here. Can anybody guess what it might be made of? I'm gonna hold it up a little bit closer to see it. If you can see the texture at all, maybe not, but if you have a, a guess, feel free to write it in the chat or uh, temporarily unmute yourself. I think Alexis does. Oh, okay, Alexis, what do you think it's made of? Horse hair? Good job. Yes, it's made of horse hair. It comes from the horse's tail. So you've ever um, gone into a string shop? Sometimes you'll see when they're working on their bows, there's just like this big tuft of uh, horse tail hair that's just hanging out on the wall. So they'll take a, a chunk of that and then they will carefully place it on your bow when you need to go in for a rehair or something. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the bow hold. So there's a few ways to hold the bow. If you are a super beginner. I, before you go on, I just noticed that Alexis has a question. I'm oh, like an it. sure. Alexis, what's your question? Um, if, if they have like a pieces of horse hair in the wall, how long would it take to make a bow if you put one, one string by one? Oh, so they don't, they don't put it on like string by, uh, hair by hair. Um, they'll just take a chunk, like a thin chunk, just the right amount for uh, it to fit on the bow. And then uh, they wet it so that it's easier to handle. And then they just, you know, uh, loop it in on one end and then loop it in on the other end. And then they wait for it to dry a little bit. Oh, can I? Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. I hope that answers your question, Alexis. Um, are there any other questions? No? Okay. I think we're good. All right. So for the bow, um, if you don't have a bow just at home, if you have a pencil or a pen, either of those writing utensils will work great. I'm going to use a bow for now, but I might switch over to a pencil in a little bit. So if you are a super beginner, I usually will have you hold the bow with your right hand. Oh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so the right hand, I will have you just grab the, what we call the frog. This is the bottom part is called the frog. I'll just have you grab um, with your right hand with what I call a bear paw until you, you know, get the hang of trying to hold a stick and playing it on something that's sitting on your left shoulder. After, I don't know, depending on the student, maybe like five to 10 lessons later, I might ask you if you might be interested in switching over to a more proper bow hold. So it'll look something like this. And then maybe a year or so later, or maybe earlier, depending on um, the, the student, uh, I'm gonna have you move your thumb inward so that it's a little bit closer to the rest of the fingers. Let me push, push it this way. 
So here versus here. Okay. Um, so for the bow hold, we're going to go with the one where the thumb is more outward. We are going to pretend that our right hand is a bunny, a cute little fluffy bunny. So you're going to make this shape with your hand, just nice and round. What we don't want is to make a wolf, which looks like this. So nothing is straight and pointed, nice and round, gentle. Okay. And then with your bow in your left hand or your pen or pencil, you're going to pretend that it's a carrot and you are going to feed the rabbit, the carrot. And so here's our, this is our eyes, nose, and the top of the mouth. And these are our ears here. Okay. I'm gonna switch over to the pencil really quick so you can um, see what that looks like. So here's our, here's our bunny, here's our carrot, and then we're gonna feed the bunny, the carrot. Okay, everyone is good so far? Okay, all right. So you'll notice that with the bow holes, um, these ones are together, and the pinky is probably the most upright of them all standing upright and the index finger is slanted sideways like it's taking a nap on the bow. So we want these three to be a little bit more slanted, but these are together, your middle finger and ring finger. And then your pinky is standing nice and upright and your thumb is just slightly bent. You don't want to have it straight like this because then we have a wolf, which is what we're avoiding. So nice and round. And that's your bow hold. Okay. Um, any questions about the bow hold? No? Okay, very good. So we're gonna grab our violin or your stuffy or your tissue box or what have you. So you're gonna put your violin in your left hand. We're gonna do our stop flip tuck. So stop on the diagonal, and then flip, the inside of your arm pointing up to the ceiling, and then tuck without hitting yourself in the face. Good. And then with your right hand, you're gonna have your bow hold or your bear paw, whatever works for you right now. I'm gonna go into the bow hold. And we are now going to pretend that we're a pilot. And so like any good pilot, we want to carefully land our a bow or a plane on the tarmac. We don't want to crash or throw our bow across the room. That would not be good. So we want to carefully land on a string, your choice, as long as you don't crash, please. Okay. All right, good. Let's see how Theo's doing, because you have a violin. That looks <laughs> Good. Can I see you land your airplane? Nice. Very good. Oh, and you have like a kind of a bow hold too. That's great. Is your pinky on top of the bow versus like draping over? Okay, that looks more on top. That's good. And then you can slant your index finger more sideways, the right pointer finger. You can have it like this. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Instead of like this or this, you just wanna rest it, flop it on your bow. Right, good. Nice work. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Okay, so the bow, um, we are going to talk about seesawing. So with our bow that has safely landed on the tarmac, we're going to seesaw to different strings. We have four strings that we can pivot to. Um, and I'll just tell you really quick what the strings are. So the one that's on the far right, or my, my right, um, this is what we call the E string. It is noticeably thinner than the other three strings. So we have E, then we go one over. This is A, and then D. 
and G is the thickest one, and so the far left, if you're looking down the violin, so E, A, D, and G. So you notice that I was using alphabet letters to identify the string names. So in music, if you're not aware, we only use the letters A through G in the alphabet. And I mean, just having those four strings and using four fingers on our left hand, the possibilities are endless for all the music that you can play with that. Okay, so we're gonna put our bow on, let's say the A string. And then we're gonna seesaw or pivot to the D string. So you notice that even just going from the A string to the next one over, that my elbow is lifting slightly to get to the next string. And then it will lift more if I wanna to go to the G string. And if I'm going down to the A, the elbow is resting on your side, close to your side of the body. So I like to play a game with my students where um, I'll have them seesaw really quickly to whatever string names I call out. It's kind of like Simon says, and the goal is to correctly but quickly pivot to whatever string I call out. And sometimes I'll throw in some weird outliers like Z or X. And of course you wouldn't pivot to them because you know that there's only A, D, G, and E to pivot to, right? <laughs> um, does anybody want to maybe throw some letters in the chat for strings I can pivot to? And make sure you only use the letters A, E, D, and G. So if you wanna, if you wanna throw some letters, oh, okay, G. <laughs> Anybody else? Throw me any letter. Oh, A, okay. <laughs> X, there's no X. D, okay. Okay, we'll do a couple more, two more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, so that would be one example of a game that I would have you do when you're first figuring out how to maneuver the bow on your instrument. Okay, very good. So now we're going to talk about the bow actually moving. So we don't want to have the bow looking like this or like this. It's not pretty and you're not going to get a really good sound that way or this way. It's not really productive. So what we're going to use as our uh, frame of reference is the bridge. Remember the bridge? So it's the little sliver of wood that's holding up your strings. So you want to keep it, the bow parallel to the bridge. So no X's. This is an X to the bridge. This is also an X to the bridge. So we don't want that. We want to have it nice and straight. And then when we actually do start moving the bow, the elbow is not going to be swinging forward or back. So the, I'm going to just lower my, screen a little bit. So on most shirts, there's a side seam, right? So you want your right elbow to be approximately in line with that side seam of your shirt. And that's usually, it's an okay reference for trying to keep parallel to your, your string. So if your elbow is doing this, that means it's too in front of your uh, side seam. And then if you do this, it's too far back behind your side seam. Okay, so the elbow is going to stay fixed, pretty fixed on this sideline, and then you're just going to open the forearm out like a door. Okay, um, the only exception would be like if you're approaching the 
frog, which is the bottom part of the bow. If you're starting to approach the frog, your elbow can't help but you know come a little bit higher up on your chest. That's okay. Um, but we just don't want the elbow to be moving around too much because then it, it loses its point of contact on the strings. So is there a question here? Oh, okay. It's just not my Halloween recital. Um, okay, let's see how we're doing. Okay, so once you get those basics down, the stop, flip, tuck, your left hand looks like so, not the pancake or sticking out like this. Then you have your bow hold. And then you carefully place it on the string in between the fingerboard and the bridge and your elbows in place. And you, just open up. you can play all sorts of things like or maybe something like for you as we come close to wrapping up, which is for students who are just beginning or maybe for families who are just beginning or thinking about beginning violin lessons, what's your best advice for them in terms of how to get started and what to think about? Uh, well, first you need to acquire a violin. Um, you can rent from CMC or any of the local uh, violin shops around the Bay Area. And um, once you do start taking lessons, uh, I think just, you know, keeping an open mind and not being too hard on yourself in the beginning for, uh, you know, not progressing as quickly as you might want. Um, I've been playing for most of my life and I'm still finding things that I have to improve upon. So if you realize, if you notice that you haven't become a, a concert violinist in a week, that's okay. It's usually a case for most people that they don't progress that quickly. Rome was not built in a day. Um, and you have to make sure that you commit a certain amount of time to practicing your violin or viola uh, as many days of the week as possible. I know that everyone is busy and you have uh, all sorts of activities that you do, but if you can set aside even you know, five, 10 minutes every day, that's better than just practicing like once or twice a week. Um, so consistency, um, figuring out like what your goals are for the practice session, like what you wanna work on and get better at. And um, usually in your lesson, I would be giving you an assignment uh, of something to focus on during the week. And so uh, just, you know, lots of patience, lots of patience, uh, Give yourself always a pat on the back for just showing up to your practice session and giving it your best. I think those are um, the three things that I would. I have a question. Sure. Um, does it tense up your neck and shoulder? Does it tense up your neck and shoulder? Uh, you want to try to not tense up too much, but um, especially if you don't play with the shoulder rest like me, just because it works for my body structure. Um, there has to be a certain amount of tension in your neck uh, to hold up the violin. And, um, but you, you just don't wanna have an excess of that tension. So doing like, you know, neck rolls in between um, practice sessions um, or even within the practice session is good. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's going to be just like a certain amount to have, but you just don't want to have too much. Okay. I just also want to, I heard that it takes quite a long time to get a good sound, to, to even learn how to get a good sound from a violin. Is that true? Oh, Is it yes. Student? oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it depends on the student too. Like if they had, um, previous experience with other instruments, 
um, they know like what maybe makes up a good sound or they've listened to a lot of recordings. Um, so maybe they have like a kind of sound in mind and they're focusing on trying to achieve that. Whereas um, maybe some other students, they haven't had the same kind of exposure or the same amount of exposure. So it's a little bit harder. Um, but of course the coordination itself, that does take a lot of time to, uh, to get under your belts. Um, but that's what you have a teacher for. <laughs> Heidi, Walter Meyer asks uh, about the different fingerings between a violin and a viola. Do you want to mention some of the differences between a violin and a viola? Uh, sure. So a viola is uh, the slightly larger cousin of the violin, um, but it has different strings than a violin does. So they don't have an E, uh, so their substitute is actually an A. And then they have the same strings as we do, D, G, until they get to the, the lowest one, which is a C for them. So it would sound like, it would sound like that. But uh, in terms of fingering, the finger numbers is not different for the instruments, but the location of the notes are going to be slightly different. Um, and whenever I have to switch over to viola for a concert or something, <laughs> There is always like a big mental switch for me. It's like, oh, where I would normally place my uh, first finger on the, I don't know, the A string, for example. It's not the second string over on the viola, but rather the farthest one to the right. So that always uh, gives me a good mental workout when I have to switch over to the viola. But the viola and violin, like how you hold it, um, is all the same. It's just, it's a lot heavier and a lot bigger. Thanks. We have one last question from Theo. Uh, a question about the challenges of teaching and learning online versus in person. Uh, you know, what are some of the differences and how do you handle those as a teacher? Um, so for me personally, my teaching style is a little bit more lecture based. Um, with the occasional hands-on um, um, direction if we were in person. Uh, so I think the biggest challenge for me has for virtual teaching has been if I have to correct like, you know, a body positioning, um, it's hard when I'm not there and my words are not coming across to them. So if you're a younger student, like maybe, you know, elementary school level, it's often really good to have a parent in the room so that they can be my hands to you know, help move your elbow in the right spot or your left hand, making sure it's not in a pancake or this kind of position. Um, and the sound quality is uh, obviously not as good as uh, being in the same room as one another. But uh, yeah, we just make do and um, try to make the best of the, the situation and being supportive of one another. Totally. Thank you, Heidi. I think um, you, what you've explained is definitely some of the feedback we've heard from other teachers, you know, that the desire to sort of physically correct and then also the sound issues are probably the biggest challenges, but I just have to say I've been so impressed by how you and all your colleagues have handled the challenges of, you know, moving online and just seeing what great success is really possible. I think your lesson showed us that today. So thank you so much. It's been so great to be here with you and all of you. Uh, it is true. If you would like to see some of Miss Heidi's students in action, you can join us for her Halloween virtual recital uh, on October 31st at 9 a.m. It will be spooky and spectacular. There's an Eventbrite uh, link that you can sign up so that you can join the Zoom. Uh, and again, just as a reminder, it's our, um, we have a special offer today as part of our open house to uh, get six lessons for the price of five plus 35% off. So please, if you're a new student, if you're thinking about coming back to CMC, we would love to have you in our community. Uh, and we hope that this helps. Uh, thank you again to Heidi. Thank you to Anne, everybody who helped us to uh, put together our, our virtual um, open house today. It's just been so great. And thank you to all of you for being here. We hope this music brought you some joy today. Uh, and we hope to see you again around CMC online. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much and have a great weekend.